by the end of this 10-year odyssey, what we're left with is an item that might be or might not be associated with Jesus' family. But the Bible does record what happens to James. His fate will impact the course of world history. It's thought this ossuary once held the bones of Jesus' brother James. His story may have been hidden, but there are clues to his life. In the Gospel according to brothers, Thomas, Jesus tells his disciples when they want to find leadership after his departure, they should go to James. James was a very devout man. Um, a second century historian tells us that James was continually on his knees praying, so much so that he had callous knees like a camel's knees. James becomes the first bishop of Jerusalem. My brother. He becomes a kind of rock of the movement in many ways because he provides the kind of stability that a new Christian movement like that needs. Over time, he progressively develops a sense of commitment and ownership for his brother's message. Clear. But his authority is soon to be challenged by someone who was once a sworn enemy of Jesus and his teachings. Paul had been one of the Pharisees who was against the Jesus group, who changes sides, as it were. And once he comes into the community, he just comes in incredibly strongly and takes a huge role. Paul has been traveling across the Roman Empire, preaching his own version of the Jesus message for more than 10 years. His manifesto has even reached non-Jews or Gentiles. The tricky issue of what do we do with Gentiles was the hot button issue in earliest Christianity. You have to remember all of the earliest followers of Jesus were Jews, all of them. So where do the Gentiles fit into this? Paul doesn't want the Gentiles to convert to Judaism in order to become Christian, in order to be followers of the Christ. His letters to new Christian communities, the epistles, make up a third of the New Testament. His teachings show how determined he is to reach out to Gentiles. Jesus said, go and make disciples of all the nations. And that meant not just the Jews, if I were James, and I had heard about Paul and what Paul was doing, I would be hugely frustrated. Paul never met the human Jesus. Here was James, who was Jesus' brother, and this upstart was presuming to teach Jesus' message and go out among the Gentiles with this message. Things get so bad in the relations between Paul and James, that ultimately they have to have a big conference in Jerusalem to sort it out. Around 50 AD, 20 years after the execution of his brother Jesus, James presides over a council of the movement's leaders. The outcome will decide the future. Will they remain a small Jewish sect, or will Christianity stand alone? Paul comes to defend the salvation afforded by the death and resurrection of Christ that also extends to Gentiles, and he brings a saved Christian to Jerusalem in order to try to prove his point. Here is my friend, Titus the Greek. Paul brings with him Titus, an uncircumcised Greek, as a sort of symbol of the gospel that he's preached. And he's really bringing him there to say to everyone, so what are you going to do about this? The only thing that counts is faith. When we read the Acts of the Apostles, it's quite clear that there's tension, and there's especially tension between James and Paul. So if you were Jesus' brother and this upstart came along, preaching and teaching a different message from the one that you had learned, from your brother. I imagine you would have felt immense frustration. What the council are witnessing, my brothers, is the birth of early Christianity. The process by which Christianity and Judaism become two different things is a process that takes centuries. That said, in my opinion, 
we just Paul's decision is a critically important moment in that division. Jewish or Greeks, slaves or free. Paul clearly believes you really need to go out there and spread the message if your legacy is going to be protected. Listen to me. James is a Torah true Jew, and he got along apparently just fine with the Jewish authorities. But this Jewish following of Jesus had really taken on a life of its own. It wasn't just another sect of Judaism. It was a movement. James eventually sides with Paul. This decision will soon revolutionize Christianity. But it will also seal James's fate. He is now seen as a threat to the Jewish religious order. James was the face of early Jewish Christianity in Jerusalem. He represented all of that. And so, of course, the authorities are going to take out on him whatever they had heard about the revolutionary beliefs about the followers of Jesus. At that point, the Jewish authorities knew that they couldn't control this. In in spite of James's good behavior, they still associated him with that troublemaker Jesus that had been crucified back in the early 30s. James is arrested on the orders of the same Jewish priesthood who only three decades earlier had condemned his brother Jesus to death. Jerusalem, A.D. 62. A leading member of the Jewish priesthood gives James an ultimatum. Renounce his brother Jesus as his Messiah or face death. But James refuses. The link between Jesus and James ultimately means that James can't survive. James is led to the temple walls. Only a few hundred meters from where Jesus was crucified. He's martyred for this cause and he's martyred uh, for his sincere devotional piety. But pushing James from the walls doesn't kill him. Ancient texts record that the final blows come when he's stoned to death and his body is buried on the spot where he falls. In accordance with Jewish custom of the time, one year after his death, James's bones would have been collected and interned in an ossuary. I think it is likely that James' body was claimed by his followers and buried, there was considerable support from within the city of Jerusalem, right across the board, for James to be honored against the demeaning death that was inflicted on him. After James's murder, the crucial role he played in the development of the early church will fade from view. But today in Jerusalem, James is still venerated. The 12th century Armenian cathedral is dedicated to him. St. James is our first patriarch. We feel privileged that our uh, brotherhood here in St. James are in direct succession and in direct line to St. James, uh, the first bishop of Jerusalem. In our daily prayers, James is our Lord. James is sitting next to Christ. It's claimed the cathedral is built on the site of James's home. Worshippers also believe his remains are buried here. According to Armenian tradition, the bones of St. James were brought from the valley of Kidron, where they were originally buried, 
and they were reburied under the main altar of the present St. James Cathedral. But what happened to the box that first held his mortal remains? So is the James Ossuary real or not? That's a tough question. The jury is still out on that one. At the end of it, you still have a mystery. We'll never quite know if the James Ossuary is real or not. We'll never quite know if it's that James, the brother of Jesus. After Golan is acquitted of forging the inscription, the ossuary is eventually returned to him. Now he is hoping to put it on display for a second time. It should be exhibited to people who have interest in early Christianity, and we have a lot of material now that everyone can evaluate, read, and even get his own impression or conclusion. But the dispute over the authenticity of the box has left one lasting legacy. I think James the Just is one of the most important figures in earliest Christianity. And the controversy about the ossuary has caused people to become more aware of the fact that Jesus had brothers and that James was preeminent among them. So why has James's memory been lost to history? We're guided so much by the theology that suggests that Mary can't really have had other sons than Jesus. It was really that idea that Mary was a perpetual virgin that really kicked Jesus' siblings off stage in the history of Christianity. The first Gospels are written only a few years after James' death by which time Christianity, as it will become known, is already moving away from its Jewish roots. By the second century, there were more Gentiles in the early church than there were Israelites. And the memory of James was diluted. And now we come to think of him as a purely historical figure and not as the transitional figure that he truly was. Theologically, it becomes difficult for us to talk about the important history of the early Jesus movement, and that history does involve James. Everyone else knew Jesus. They knew Jesus the great teacher. They knew Jesus the great healer. James knew the invisible Jesus. James knew the Jesus that he was when no one was watching.